Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, let's just stand up for a minute. Let the blood run round your butt. Just while we pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for becoming my Father, our Father. Thank you for calling me your son. Thank you for calling us your sons. Thank you for going one step further and calling us your friends. Mind-blowing, just incredible. How can we possibly be not just sons of God, but, but the friends of God, the confidants, the but we thank you. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the Jesus of Abba Father. This is the God of the Bible, not the God of religion. And so tonight, ungodlike God and unmessiah like Messiah, we thank you that we've been given the opportunity to, to bump into you. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I talk to you for a few minutes, um, but I need to just preface this by saying... Um, uh, my thanks to Joel and to Jenny for um, two excellent weeks of, um, of input into the house. I thought Joel's um, uh, summary text of It Is Finished was excellent and, uh, you know, well worth, um, well worth writing down and observing. It's really well put together and really expresses the, the truth that it is finished. The last word has not been spoken because we don't have the last word. It's finished. Um, and also, um, uh, what I have to say is, I, I was um, uh, awake in the night from about just before four o'clock. I had, had a story from the Bible, a, a, a piece of the Bible running through my head, just haunting me. So I didn't go back to sleep. I'm throwing, tossing this around, and I'm thinking about it. And then uh, uh, got up about... Um, 5.45 and thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll just catch up because, as Chris said, we've been busy, haven't had time to catch up on what's been happening here. So I, uh, I went online and, uh, and listened to Jenny and, and listened to Joel. And uh, what was interesting was that the scripture that had been going around in my head all the time was, was the scripture that Jenny read in two weeks ago on the, on the Saturday night. And um, I thought, well, that's interesting because I hadn't listened to what Jenny had said. I mean, I'd seen the tweets about the rocks and the big rocks, little rocks, the sand all. But I hadn't, um, I hadn't consciously made myself aware of the scripture that she'd used. So, so I wrestled with this. So um, having wrestled with this, I want to talk some more about that scripture, if that's all right, Jen. Um, um, but this is not that Jenny didn't do it justice. It was part of what Jenny said, but I, I, I want to add to and just a slightly different direction to, to talk about, about this um, scripture. Now, let me also repeat what I said um, three weeks ago, I guess, um, about, about our purpose. This is what I said. Our reason for teaching and being is to sharpen your axe, to give you an edge, so you can effectively tackle the issues facing you and those around you in life to aid you to live in the favor that God has proclaimed over your life, free from condemnation, guilt, and shame, and to be part of a never-ending, expanding, peaceable kingdom as a follower of the Jesus who showed us what God looks like so you can show others the same. That, that's the reason for doing what we're doing. It's the reason for what I'm doing tonight. And hopefully we can feed some more into that. So the scripture that Jenny read two weeks ago, I want to just read again just to give you some background. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 10 and from verse 25. <clears throat> uh, that picture is important for what I want to talk about tonight because I'm going to talk about the point, okay? The point. Talked about purpose last time. Tonight we're going to talk about the point and missing the point, okay? But let me read this scripture to you first. Luke 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. 
Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, look after him, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Minibar is going to get used definitely on that deal. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Um, I've struggled with this, this few verses. As I've struggled with other parts of the Bible, that the reason being that it, it doesn't fit my used to be neat boxes of evangelical theology. Um, if you really listen and think about it, the, the, the guy asks about eternal life and Jesus finishes up talking about neighbours. Uh, which could have been as much about the Australian TV series as far as, as I'm concerned in the way it moves to the point at its conclusion. So... As I wrestle with this and struggle with this, the, the question is, what is the point? What is Jesus' point? Because, because I, I, my, my boxes are being shattered as to, as to what is important and the focus of what is really the point and what is the point in Jesus' message. Now, the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, is, is a good question, but sometimes that question is not asked in the proper context that it needs to be Answered, and we may say a little bit about that later. We'll see. We'll see how we goes. Uh, have you noticed ever how many of Jesus' parables um, finish without a real finish? You know, go and do thou likewise is not a finish. That's that's not a real finish. It, it's it's actually something else. Just like just like the story of the woman who had who had been taken by the legalists because she was committing adultery with a guy who wasn't her husband. And, and Jesus' last words to her was, go and sin no more. And we don't, we don't read any more about the woman any more than we read any more about this guy here. But we have this strange thing with Jesus that, that it seems to be pointing us somewhere rather than telling us something. It's like... A, it's like Rather than a be-all something, it's a direction, it's a, it's a somewhere that we need to head. And um, I am coming more and more to understand that the expression of salvation and its somewhere is not somewhere over there beyond this ceiling up in the outer reaches of the solar systems. But the somewhere actually is, is not a heaven that is somewhere else, but a heaven that is here and a heaven that is present. The rather than two things running, existing parallel side by side, that actually manifests itself into time rather than just somewhere that, that we go. And again, that's another conversation and sometime we'll talk about the nature of what we think heaven is and, and what we mean by it, but... I'm trying to wrestle with what did Jesus mean when he, when he did these things because um, evangelically I, I would have said the answer to the question would be wait a little while because I'm going to give my life on a cross and I'll pay for all your sin and then if you believe in me. But Jesus didn't answer that way so there has to be something we have to wrestle with here um, about, about the point of, 
of, of this whole thing. So, so, so it seems that, that Jesus was often pointing us somewhere rather than telling us something, showing us the way to a kingdom in this world but not of this world, showing the way to where favor rests, which I, I more and more am becoming aware of. There is a favor of God that I want you to live in and I want you to be, be part of. Just one little side issue um, on that. There is a huge difference between consequence and punishment. How we view uh, sometimes God and therefore the message of God and the message about God, if we get that wrong in its fundamental basis, then we think that what happens to us in life is punishment from God which was a very prevalent belief even among the Jewish community in the time that, that Jesus walked the earth because if you were sick, they believed you were being punished by God for either your sins or you're being punished because of your parents' sins. So everything was connected to God and, and punishment and I, I think that's a sad indictment and has been one of the sad things about the gospel that is still often promoted because... Um, Punishment is a great way to manipulate people into false behaviors. Now, I say false behaviors because when you do as you're told doesn't necessarily mean that you've changed at all. That's why Jesus one day said, okay, um, if you looked at a woman in lust, Jesus said, that's as good as adultery. You haven't done anything, but you, you know, as far as we're concerned, it was there in your heart. So your behavior might look great, but actually inside. So, so, so there's a difference, and, and, and in life, uh, uh, we have to understand that many of the things that we face are not punishments, they are consequences. You make dumb choices, you get dumb consequences, okay? As Albert Einstein once said, uh, that there are, uh, there are um, uh, two, two infinite things. The universe, he said, I believe there are two things that are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. So, so we've got to be careful not to confuse consequence with punishment because when we confuse those, we start to lay something onto God which actually shouldn't be on, on God's shoulders. So, so anyway, um, the context of, of, of this story is there's a guy who's an expert in religious law. Okay. He's, a, he's a bit of a theologian. He pretty much knows everything that is to be known about religious law and the scriptures as they had them then and what he thought was the application of scripture. And uh, this guy in this story is, is making a point while being successfully missing the point. And uh, one of the things that I am afraid of, I'm not afraid of a lot, but one of the things I am afraid of um, as we develop in our desire to understand the real God of Jesus, the one who is made flesh in Jesus, is I'm, I'm afraid of being in a situation where we are making a point but missing the point. Uh, this guy didn't seem to have a problem with that. See, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, well, you know, um, what, what do you see in the law? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, um, um, you know, Jesus said to the guy, he said, well, so, so um, that's what's written, okay. Uh, Jesus said, you've answered correctly. That's what's written in the law. Do this and you will live. Um, well, see, here's the issue. The correct response to Jesus' affirmation of his correctly answering his own question should have been, not who is my neighbor, it should have been, but that's impossible. How can anybody love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength, and then if you've done that, actually love your neighbor to the same degree with the same amount of resources and with the same effectiveness that you love yourself. The, the correct response should have been, that's impossible, I need grace, I need mercy. 
See, Jesus' Jesus' point was to bring this guy to understand that even if there were only two commandments, those two commandments are so impossible to keep if you think that performance makes you right with God, that all you can do is fall into the arms of grace and say, well, as Martin Luther once prayed, I am yours, save me. The only appropriate prayer. But this guy, like a lot of us, he just didn't get it. He didn't get the point. And the point of of all that law in the Bible was never to show you how you could live, it was to show you how with your best efforts you never would be able to live, okay? That was the point. So this this guy, uh, instead of, of saying, I need grace, I need mercy, that's impossible, he tries to deflect from his true condition by shifting the focus of attention like a lot of us do. Remember, in the Garden of Eden, God comes looking for Adam, and Adam says, it was the woman you gave me, and she said it was the serpent. Um, because we're always trying to deflect the focus of our own life, partly because somehow we have developed a fear that if we live in the full focus of the reality of our own lives, that that will bring condemnation and, and shame and judgment, rather than realizing that, that recognizing that brings grace and brings mercy and brings the kindness of God, not the judgment of God, upon our life. So, so this guy's trying to deflect it. And because of that, he forces Jesus into a hugely confrontational answer in the form of a story. Okay. So Jesus says, listen, here's the deal. There was a man who was set upon by robbers who stripped him and left him half dead. Now, we now have someone in the story with wounds who they were inflicted by is now irrelevant because in the story the the robbers have long gone. So already there is a, 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 a story emerging here about someone stripped and wounded, but the point is not, was it their fault? Were they responsible? Should he have not been on the road alone? Was it because he walked alone on the road that he was attacked by robbers? Is it the robber's fault? Because really he was just minding his own business going from Jericho to Jerusalem and he was set upon by robbers. And we spend endless hours trying to figure out when we experience woundedness in ourselves or woundedness in others, was it my fault? Was it their fault? What caused it? How did it happen? When actually the situation that caused it is long gone. That is not now the problem. The who, the what, the why, the how, the when is not the problem. The problem is now the wounds. We have a wounded person. So, so he was stripped naked and left half dead. So, so both his dignity and his identity have been taken from him. See, Everybody would have understood who listened to Jesus the inner workings of this story because in those days, very much what you wore is what you were. So your, your, your status in society could be observed simply by seeing what you were wearing. Okay? Remember when Jesus was finally taken to be crucified and and the, the, the soldiers cast lots for his garment because it was a kingly garment. Why? Because he was a king, okay? So, so here we've got a story that to them they're thinking, okay, so the guy's stripped naked, so, so he's not only lost his dignity because now he's naked and exposed to the world and beaten and half dead, but his identity has been, has been taken away. So now we don't know his class, we don't know his status, we just know that he's wounded and he is without dignity and his identity has been impacted by this event. So most of our problems in, are the result of identifying ourselves by what we have done on the one hand or achieved on the other hand. So identity is very important to all of us and and we have to wrestle with this challenge to understand that in the context of who we are, most of our problems result from either identifying ourselves with what we have done. So now I am this because I did that, okay? Lots of that goes on. I am this because I did that. And society helping you not to forget that you are this because you did that. Identity, see, it's our identity connected to what we've done. 
And um, most of us, no matter how much we do a bit of an Adam and Eve with leaves and bushes and try to hide, uh, at, the root, at the root of all our issues is identity. Now, that's a pretty, pretty strong statement. You say, well, you know, is that preacher's license? Are you over-exaggerating? Well, fascinatingly enough, when, when Jesus was about to begin his ministry, having lived on earth, and he hasn't done any miracles or anything, but he goes to be baptized uh, by, by John the baptizer in the River Jordan. And what happens is, is the Bible says heaven opened and the Holy Spirit came in bodily form like a dove. And they heard a voice that said, you're my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you. And from that point, it says, his, minist- his ministry began, his miracles began. His, his powerful declarations began. His understanding began in massive measure because there was an identity issue. See, even Jesus, when his identity issue was resolved, found the power, the kingdom within that was released. So it's very important that we understand that, that, that our life is massively connected to identity. Um, very often that is linked to what we think of ourselves or what we think others think of us, more so than what we think God thinks of us, and learning to draw our identity from what God thinks of us. That's why, that's why um, uh, John, who was the disciple of Jesus, who probably understood the inner workings of, 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 of how the kingdom connects better than anyone, came with this conclusion. He says, God is love, and then he makes a statement and says, hey, listen, Now we are the sons of God. And that is what we are, the sons of God. That's what John says, because he's also understood that we have an identity issue. Why? Because all of us, somehow, at some time in life, have been set upon. We have been robbed. We have been left naked and half dead. Our identity has been spoiled. And Jesus' point is that in the gospel, the identity that we discover will then determine how we behave and that will determine our revelation of the kingdom of God and the goodness of God and the kindness of God. So it either comes, it either comes because we have, um, the, because, um, uh, uh, because of what we've done on the one hand or what people think of us or I, our identity or we identify ourselves uh, by what we've achieved on the other hand. So we try and, and, and deal with our inadequacies and everything else by a constant declaration of what we have achieved. So I, I meet mostly two kinds of people in ministry. People who are very self-effacing. Oh, I'm rubbish, I'm terrible. Um, you know, I've done this. How could anybody love me? And then the other side, I meet the people who, I'm brilliant, I'm amazing, I'm so qualified, I'm so fantastic. You know, everybody loves me, everybody wants me. Um, we, we had one of those incidents in India with a young lady that we're familiar with who uh, went out of the conference quick on the final day with the statement, I can't stay any longer because all these men want me. Really? I'd hardly noticed that she was there, but all these men want me. See, she was finding her identity because of her own inadequacies and her own lack of self-worth. She was then finding her identity by saying, but I have achieved beauty. I have achieved sexuality. So when I walk in a room, every man wants me and then wants to create a drama. Can you see? It's all the issues of identity. And Jesus is actually driving here that at the root of this problem is a root of identity. This expert in the law had a problem with his identity. He was trying to find his security in his identity, which was a false identity because he had based it in his achievements and his knowledge, and therefore he was now struggling. And Jesus is trying to dismantle Every false place that we build of trust, and he's doing it very cleverly. So the gospel has to be more than just this guy, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus told him he couldn't understand what was being said. He missed the point. So now Jesus focuses in and says, if we don't get to grips with this identity problem, then we're probably not going to get very far. So he tells the story of this guy set on and now, of course, there's all those inner little things that if we were Jews in first century Palestine, we're now thinking, okay, he's lost his garment, he's lost his identity. Um, and, uh, and then 
uh, he says a priest comes by where the guy is at the side of the road and, and the priest sees him uh, but carries on, just pays no attention. He sees him but does nothing about it. And then the Levite, who's kind of a uh, part of the religious community that's a little bit lower than the priest, but each of them represent what would be the whole of the religious structure. He sees the guy in trouble. He sees him naked. He sees him... Uh, wounded, and he also walks by and doesn't and doesn't touch him. Now, now, um, what you need to understand about this is that um, their religious belief forbade them from helping the guy who was wounded, even though his wounds were genuine, even though he'd been set upon, even though he had a need. Their religious belief didn't allow them to get involved in his life. So many times in Jesus' stories, religion got in the way rather than assisted as illustrated here. I have come to the conclusion that more often religion gets in the way than actually assists in the helping of wounded people who have uh, lost their identity and have been left for dead. And often we can't do what needs to be done to heal their lives and encourage them because all the stuff that we've had put into us by our religious background stops us from, from doing that. See, religion, it got in the priest's way and it got in the wounded man's way. The priest couldn't help him because of what they believed. The man couldn't be helped because of what they believed. So he's left there. And, and there's also within here this, this sad thing that, that um, the more we get involved from a religious perspective rather than, than, than the right perspective, um, the need to hold some kind of moral superiority and demonstrate some kind of personal purity becomes an insurmountable obstacle to love shining through. And that's what was going on with these guys. Love couldn't shine through because they had this distorted sense of moral superiority and personal purity. And I've lived there and I've, I've been there and I've done that. And um, I've hurt some people because I didn't understand that, that I was this person um, legally schooled in what I thought was the, the, the definition of Scripture while finding then that I wouldn't help some people because of what they were into and what they did and what their lifestyle was and what sin they had committed uh, because of a moral superiority. We just don't go there. It'll almost like, listen, we're going to catch the fish, but the fish have to clean themselves before, before we bring them in kind of stuff. So I, I have to apologize and say I've, I've been there in my own life, so I understand this. And it, it stops the love of God shining through. Now, knowing who Jesus is talking to, um, which is this um, religious lawyer, what he says next is the most offensive suggestion imaginable to this very pure Jewish expert in Jewish religious law. Because Jesus said, here's the priest who you respect, you know, because he's like you, schooled in the law. Here's the Levite you respect, he's like you, schooled in the law. But he said, but along comes a Samaritan. Now, that's no big deal to us until you understand that to every Jew, the, the Samaritans were a hated, half-breed, inbred, idolater-worshipper of false gods and corrupted belief. Um, that's who they were. They, it, it, it was historic the fact that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. We have nothing to do with them. We are purer than them. They're half-breeds. They're inbreeds. They're idolatrous. Uh, in other words, their lifestyle and belief system doesn't match up with our expectation of their lifestyle and belief system. Therefore, there was actually a hatred. They hated Samaritans. And Samaritans also hated, hated Jews. There was a hatred going on. So Jesus is now proposing to this guy in his moral superior position that the one who helped the person who was naked and in need is somebody who actually he actually hates and will have nothing to do with them. See, I, I don't know what the Samaritan would represent for you and others 
uh, you know, depending on where you sit, these issues come up. It may be a gay man or woman, it may be a transgender, maybe an adulterer, it might be a struggling alcoholic, it might be a fallen pastor, it might be a wayward youngster, it might be a potty mouth preacher, it might be a failed father. It could be any of those things. What, whatever would be to you someone who you would say, that's not appropriate. That should not be allowed from that kind of person. That's the point that Jesus is making here. And so this this hated Samaritan, and bear in mind that, that this Samaritan comes to the guy despite his own wounds, his own exclusion and the threat to his own safety because he's now in territory where the Jews would hate him and might want to kill him. It's like, it's like, it's like apartheid in South Africa. He's the black guy in a white area. Okay? So all these things are going on, his exclusion and therefore his own wounds because he's being rejected and hated. Despite all that, he acted in grace and kindness in a way that were he a convert of this religious law expert, he would, could never have done. So the Samaritan used his oil, he used his wine, he used his time, he used his donkey, he used his money, he used his promise to aid the wounded person. He invested everything that he was. And, um, you know, the oil to soothe the wounds, the wine to gladden the spirit. I heard one guy said he knew where to pour the oil and he knew where to pour the wine, both to be most helpful so that there is, there is, there is tender comfort given to the wound but also joy given to the, to the person. So the point is not that the priest and Levite should have stopped to help. The truth is they couldn't unless something radically changed in what they believed. His belief about himself and the man That's the Levite and the priest wouldn't let him. Neither could the expert, who was right at the beginning of the story, help his neighbor, even if he figured out who his neighbor was with his current understanding, he couldn't do it. It had become restrictive. So part of my point here is that there is a way that we can embrace, let's call it religious practice or belief or scriptural understanding that forbids us from doing actually what we need to do for the people who need it to be done to them and for them and towards them. And part of it because we have lost the understanding that in our own lives we need the same grace and we need the same kindness because we're all in many ways the man who was set upon and robbed. Our dignity and identity has been determined by complex social factors and influences And by distorted understandings of ourselves and others and God and salvation, we've all been wounded in some way. Jesus' point really was, as he was driving at this, that we're all like the guy who was robbed and we need to all be like the the Samaritan who helped the guy who was robbed. I put it to you that even when we get on our religious high horse, it's because we've been robbed of the ability to begin to evaluate and question what is God really like? Who is God really like? What's true about this? Who is the Jesus of the Bible where we have been told and he received that information and all it made him was a legal expert? I don't want to build a community of of religious legal experts. I would rather have a community who have a sparse knowledge of the Bible and an intimate knowledge of God than an intimate knowledge of the Bible and the sparse knowledge of God. But unfortunately, there is a confusion that this man believed because he had a legal understanding of Scripture that he knew God. But actually, Scripture had become his God. The legal standing had become his God. And so what you're not going to get in this house is hammered to say, this is the chapter and verse, this is what you must think. What you are going to get is, listen, we were all wounded, we've all been shaped. We've all had our identity touched by stuff around us. And the first thing is to really find our own identity and say, I have no place that I can stand in pride or in arrogance, asking stupid questions for stupid reasons that are trying to make a point and miss the purpose. But actually, I can come under the grace of God and say, I'm an expert at nothing. 
The only thing I'm an expert at is that I've realized more and more how much I need the grace of God and the mercy of God and the kindness of God, that I'm both the wounded man, but called not just to be the wounded man, but called to be the Samaritan, that my identity may be determined by you to be connected to my behavior or my race or my activity, but what was offensive to these guys is God said grace comes through people who let grace come through them. And that we should not stand then in judgment of those people. So far too often, our wounds overwhelm our sense of wonder. And the noise of life drowns out out the sound of heaven. And we become experts in everything that blocks the favor of God on our lives. And because of it, we miss the point. We become experts in the wrong thing. Jesus was saying, you become an expert in the wrong thing. But I'm an expert in the religious law. You become an expert in the wrong thing. Okay. So where was the expertise? Jesus said the expertise is in receiving the grace on your own life to the extent that out of the recognition of that grace that you may be rejected, you may be out of place. Your identity may have been determined, but you have discovered something bigger than that. You've discovered your identity lies in another, and out of that identity, as you begin to live, life begins to flow, not out of the perfection of your life, but out of the perfection of the one to whom you are connected. Okay? It comes out of the Father. So... I don't want us to miss the point. To close out this, the, 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 this, this neighbor naked man thing, um, Jesus' statement was, go and do that likewise. That, that's, go and do, that's, a, that's a directional, go and do likewise. He, his call to the man was, was, get off your eye horse, stop missing the point, catch the point, find your identity in me, And out of that identity, begin to love, begin to give, begin to use your oil, your wine, your resources, your donkey to help somebody else, to bless somebody else, to be kind to somebody else. Rather than pointing out their problems, why not heal their wounds? Rather than telling them how judged they are, why not give them some joy of the good news about God and put some oil on the wounds that they are bearing? Why not recognize them, not as a naked person who was set upon by robbers, but as a person, an individual, who is wounded and needs your help so you can bless them and minister to them and help them in the same way the grace of God has touched you? So it becomes a comparison here that, that, that is not just the argument of how do you get to heaven, Jesus diverts it to say, how does heaven get to you? And how do you get heaven to people? Because that's the real heart of the gospel. It does not devalue the need for a journey that brings us into relationship with the Father. But what it says is that's not a fire escape from hell. It's not insurance policy against fire and disaster. It's actually something that allows these two worlds that intertwine to become one and to connect so that what God calls favor shows up in your life. Favor, favor. Favor is something you never worked for, you didn't ask for, and you never earned. Favor is something that is given freely that you receive. And when these two worlds come together, the favor of God starts to show up. And that's my desire for you. I think the favor of God showed up for this guy who was beat up and bloody, waking up in the hotel, being able to use the minibar, knowing that somebody else was going to pay. It's called favor. Do you know when you rode on a donkey, that was also a sign of status? When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, it didn't mean he was riding in as a poor man because kings rode donkeys. Stupid to me, I'd have the biggest horse. And Kings rode donkeys. Isn't it fascinating that part of the healing of this guy was the man put him on his donkey. Why didn't the guy sit on his donkey and say, I'm going to take you to this inn, you walk alongside me. But he gave him his donkey, why? Because the guy who now has been stripped of his identity has been given the identity of a king by someone who you would never expected it of because he's received something gracious. And that, that's how this thing works and that's how it is going to work. Okay, so to close this out, Jesus says, you go and do this. It's at the heart of the gospel. You go and do this. Okay, I've got one other thing to say. In the previous chapter, Luke chapter 9, 
from verse 51, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Oh, Jesus. That's why, where's, put my picture up. Put my picture up. That's why I've got that picture up. Oh. Experts in missing the point. Just because Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, the Samaritans won't let him stay in the village. They won't get things ready for him because he's going to Jerusalem. How petty, how pathetic, how stupid. Again, it's an identity struggle. If we don't break it, we don't get the point. They had the chance to entertain the son of Abba, right? The one who was the salvation of the world, the light of the world, but they didn't want to entertain him because he's going to Jerusalem, because he doesn't fit with their model, because he's not like us. Makes it more fascinating that Jesus then used the Samaritan to illustrate his story in the next chapter. That's called grace. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Wonderful, isn't it? Samaritans is off to Jerusalem. He can't stay here. Disciples, God, Lord, can we call down fire from heaven and destroy these suckers? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And they just went on to another village. Jesus probably, like my picture, going, how can you miss the point so badly? See, we get up, hung up in all kinds of stupidities because whoever the Jesus was that we thought we knew and whoever the God was that we thought he represented turn out not to really be the God of the Bible or the Jesus sent by the Father who looks like God. And so all these dumb things start cropping up in our life and in our existence that make us then look like fools because we missed the point. And we still get in church, shall we call down fire on this church or that group because how can the kingdom of God build while they do this? or they do that, or they're entertaining sinners. Just like with Jesus, a woman anoints his feet with oil and they say, they don't say, oh, that's amazing, how wonderful. They say, if he knew what kind of woman this was, i.e. she was a prostitute, and that the, 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 the perfume she was using, she had bought with the proceeds of prostitution, they said he would not have allowed this to happen. But that's the very reason why he let it happen. Because that grace was coming through and the identity of this woman was not bound up in her wounds from her past. So she to him was not a prostitute, she to him was a woman. This was not the proceeds of her prostitution, this was a gift honouring who he was and he said she is preparing me for my burial. Guys, we can get this so wrong when we think that we have become experts in the law, experts in scripture experts in what our belief is all about. And Jesus came to turn that on its head and say you have only one place that you can safely live and that's in a place of grace and it's in a place of mercy. Which one was the neighbor? The one who showed mercy. The one who showed mercy. So Jesus said then you go and do likewise. What? Look for people on the road who've been beaten up by robbers. No. Go and look for people who need mercy. Show mercy. Show mercy. Why? Because God is abundant and rich in mercy and out of heaven flows mercy and grace and goodness and kindness to us who are the wounded person on the road from the one who was the rejected saviour we get our anointing and he desires to pour into our lives the oil to soothe our wounds and the wine to make our heart and spirit glad and I believe this is the true heart of the gospel don't be an expert in anything but grace don't get locked up in any identity other than the one that says, now we are the sons of God. And that is what we are. And he is our father. And if you live there like 
Jesus, a miracle will happen because the moment Jesus discovered his true identity and lived in that goodness of the Father, he says from that day he began to do his miracles. And that's what Chris said the week before I preached to you four weeks ago when Chris said he stood in the synagogue and he read from the prophet Isaiah and said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, he has anointed me not to bring the day of vengeance of the Lord our God but to preach the year of the Lord's favor. And at that point, he shut the book. And we have a wonderful saying about that that might be offensive to some of you, so I'm not going to say it, but he shut the book at favor. Shut the book at favor. The book over your life, as far as God is concerned, has been shut at favor. And so what is God saying? Don't you dare shut your book anywhere else. Don't keep your book open to condemnation and judgment. Shut your book on favor. Shut it on favor. Favor on you, favor on your neighbor, favor on everyone around you, and something will begin to flow from these parallel dimensions that Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, here on earth, like it is in heaven. Favor is on your life. Your identity is in him, and you just need to be an expert at grace. Father, we bless you that you've been so good to us and so kind to us and bring us to a place where we are no longer defined by who we have been, but defined by who you are. I pray that everyone in this place tonight will discover that place of grace and that place of favor in you because it's not earned, it's not achieved, but it's accepted and it's received. Help! I pray everyone in here in their heart to accept and receive the favor and the grace and the mercy and the righteousness that comes from you so that as we move forward, mercy will flow out of us and mercy will flow to us and we bring change to people's lives and our wounds get healed and we refind our identity and we get back in the kingly place on the donkey and we get to use the minibar and someone else pays. The grace of God on your life, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're through. Bless you. Love you. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.